Hi, my name is David Viorce, and I'm the co-convener of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Internet Society. How many of you are familiar with the Internet Society? <laughs> and how many of you are active in the D.C. chapter? All right, we need to increase that proportion. <laughs> Would everybody active in the chapter raise your hands? Come and see any of us after the event to get more involved. Um, the Internet Society seeks to promote a free and open Internet for the benefit of everybody in the world. Um, there's no given, it's not a given that that will remain happening. So our chapter's objective is tr to promote the kind of discourse that will advance the internet in, through significant challenges coming in the years ahead. Please join us, thanks. Thank you. Um, just one sec. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, Ambassador Sepulveda, can I ask you to take the floor, please? Well, thank you very much and good morning. I uh, appreciate you all coming out on a cold day to discuss a very interesting and important topic. Uh, I also appreciate the opportunity to open and frame and initiate the discussion for this panel. Uh, I believe I know everyone on this panel. I'm familiar with their work and it helps inform my own. Let me start at the end and, and try to work backwards a little bit. Last week, FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn and I went to Mexico to do a number of meetings on telecommunications and technology issues with a series of Mexican government officials. And during that time, we took the opportunity to visit with a group of young entrepreneurs who were using technology and the global internet as a platform for developing new businesses using the assistance and guidance provided to them at Telefonica's Tech Accelerator Program, an organization called WIRA in Mexico City. So as government officials, we were the only people in the room wearing suits, and we raised the average age fairly significantly. But we were thrilled to see what was happening and what these young Mexican entrepreneurs were doing. They were working in innovative ways to better link parents with teachers, retailers with customers, and doctors with patients. The ideas were innovative, the energy was high, and the enthusiasm was boundless. As public servants, those of us in this administration work with our friends and colleagues at home and abroad to create a legal and regulatory framework, both domestically and internationally, that enables that kind of optimism and pursuit of happiness that we saw in Mexico among these young people. Underlying the capacity of what those young people were doing to innovate and reach the world without having to jump through regulatory hoops or ask anyone for permission are two concepts that U.S. policymakers and others seek to preserve. An open internet governed by a broad range of decision makers, including industry, governments, and civil society, as well as free market competition in telecommunications networks. The subject of this panel is how to understand and help evolve the framework of internet governments to increase the inclusion of those who feel that they are left out, and two, how to defend the concepts of diffuse multi-stakeholder governance from challenges to its legitimacy and from efforts to change the way the internet operates in a manner that would make it harder for those young people in Mexico and others like them in the world to succeed. First, let me uh, address the NSA disclosures issues. In the President's speech from Friday on the administration's review of U.S. signals intelligence practices, he made clear our commitment to respecting the privacy of all people, regardless of nationality. The reforms the President announced demonstrate how public debate occurs in democratic societies and how we defend security and privacy while limiting our intelligence collection to specific priorities. As the President said, U.S. collection is for a defined list of purposes. The United States is not indiscriminately reviewing the emails or phone calls of ordinary folks. The fact that we are taking steps to reform certain intelligence programs demonstrates the respect that we have for the rights of individuals, regardless of their nationality. I believe that the President has made a compelling case to the world. Some foreign observers have chosen to conflate the issue of intelligence gathering with the American position on Internet governance, posing new challenges that could disrupt the current multi-stakeholder system. In fact, these issues are not the same. Nevertheless, given this conflation, the Administration reaffirms our commitment to the open Internet and the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance, we will redouble our efforts to strengthen and make more inclusive its policy making, standard setting, and governance organizations. 
The Montevideo statement, as we are aware that some people, I'm sorry, we are aware that some people in the world are unhappy with the status quo of internet governance. But we believe that any change should come in the form of more, not less, decentralized and inclusive participation of people, institutions, firms, experts, private citizens, and governments in multi-stakeholder institutions. Last fall, the leaders of the internet institutions, including ISOC represented here today, that are so vital to the reliable operations of the internet, issued what is now known in our community as the Montevideo Statement. That statement, noteworthy for its unanimity, expressed by the technical community and useful for engaging in important conversation, addressed four issues. First, the group expressed concern that recent surveillance allegations had undermined user trust. Second, they expressed a desire for a community effort to evolve multi-stakeholder cooperation to better address internet governance challenges. Third, they called for accelerating the globalization of ICANN and IANA functions, a set of activities related to the management of the domain name system. Finally, they stressed the need for transition from IPv4 to IPv6. Helpfully, and very importantly, the Montevideo Statement launched this conversation from the heart of the multi-stakeholder system rather than from an intergovernmental body. We appreciate the thoughtful leadership of the technical community, and we hope their efforts will spur further consideration of how we continue, can continue to make the multi-stakeholder governance system more inclusive while maintaining the stability of an open and innovative internet. The Internet Governance Forum is one venue that is fully open and therefore particularly well suited to address these issues in the most global and inclusive fashion. When the next IGF convenes this September in Istanbul, we expect that the internet community will further this conversation. More immediately, Estonian President Ilves is chairing a high-level panel on global internet cooperation and governance mechanisms that will produce a draft roadmap for a way forward on these issues in a matter of months. This panel includes a number of luminaries from government, business, and civil society. We are hopeful it can constructively contribute to this year's conversation that is unfolding in multiple venues, and we believe that any gathering on this subject should strongly consider the group's views in its dialogue. One such gathering will occur in April, when the Brazilians, in coordination and consultation with the Internet community worldwide, will host the Global Multi-Stakeholder Meeting on the Future of Internet Governance. Along with many of you, we are following the developments of this meeting, and we've been in touch with the Brazilian government as we consider the best potential role for the U.S. government. We are pleased to see announcements from the organizers that a multi-stakeholder structure will plan and execute the meeting. And from what we can tell, the Brazilian government and the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee appear to be reaching out to a wide range of stakeholders to shape the meeting itself. We believe these are good signs. While there's still much to know about how this meeting will unfold and what its lasting impact will be, I believe that it holds promise in advancing the global community's understanding of internet governance if, one, the agenda is developed in a truly multi-stakeholder fashion, two, participation at the meeting itself is broad and inclusive, and three, any follow-on activity is guided by and ultimately supportive of the multi-stakeholder system rather than an intergovernmental mechanism of centrally imposed regulations or mandates. Beyond the conference in Sao Paulo and many other intervening discussions, including the WTDC, this fall, ITU member states will gather in Busan, Korea for the Quadrennial ITU Plenipotentiary Conference. During this conference, the members will elect new leadership and establish the work of the ITU for the next four years. It's a very important conference in many respects, including in areas of great interest to the United States, such as global spectrum management, and the ways in which the world can leverage communication services to promote economic and social development. Beyond the Plenipotentiary Conference affirming the vital role for the ITU in the world's telecommunications ecosystem, we would also like to seek a greater role for the ITU in helping developing nations address broadband deployment. We expect and recognize, however, that there will be a number of proposals at the conference on more controversial topics, such as internet governance and cybersecurity. And we further expect that some of these proposals will be at odds with the multi-stakeholder principles shared by so many in the internet community, both in the United States and abroad. Ultimately, we think it's better for the ITU to focus on what needs to be accomplished to increase affordable access to communications networks and encourage the further deployment of, this, of those networks. That is honorable, manageable, and a tangible task. 
any attempt to use the ITU to revive proposals to resolve questions of Internet governance that are better dealt with in multi-stakeholder settings raises the possibility of divisive outcomes. It is our, our hope, sincerely, that that will not happen. We will oppose proposals that threaten the current Internet governance model by limiting the input of non-governmental stakeholders or substituting the existing system with one that only governments control. We will also not support new centrally imposed regulations, and we will work with countries that share our views to push back respectfully on any such initiative. We would greatly prefer a conference where the ITU works within its mandate to promote the benefits of telecommunication for member states and their citizens, especially those from the developing world. Therefore, we intend to develop a number of proactive initiatives that shape the debate and will help build a constructive agenda for the ITU. The ITU can help nations put policies and programs in place to support the build-out of broadband networks. It can advise and consult with nations on proper procedures to respond to natural disasters that destroy communications infrastructure. And it can guide and help nations as they move through their analog to digital transitions and reorganize their spectrum management to provide for, the, for participation in the world's mobile communications revolution. And there are multiple other initiatives we are eager to work with other nations and the ITU to ensure that the union continues to thrive and contribute to the prosperity and well-being of its member states and their citizens. I believe that the direction our president has given us and that secretary is executing is to promote respectful engagement combined with a vigorous defense of our national interests and values. We intend to work in that spirit on this issue going forward. I believe that this year presents a perfect opportunity for all of us to work together and tell the story of the Internet's incredible multi-stakeholder success and to ultimately preserve and strengthen an open and innovative Internet as it in continues to evolve to include all of the world's peoples and communities. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, time for a few questions? Do we have any questions from the audience here? Go ahead, uh, Mark, please. And could you identify yourself? I suppose you should wait for the microphone, too, although wait, wait, in this room. Right, wait, wait for the mic. We, we do have seats in the front for the people standing in the back. So um, I'm Mark McCarthy with the Software and Information Industry Association. Um, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your thoughtful remarks. Um, I, I want to endorse the idea that the, um, the International Telecommunications Union should be focused on a productive task, which would be um, assisting developing countries in broadband deployment at an affordable level. Uh, there really is an important task to be done there to make sure that, that the vast majority of people in the, in the world are actually connected to the Internet. Um, and I do think that for them to become involved in the Internet governance issues would be, would be a difficulty. But let me um, direct your attention and the attention of the panel to the work that a, a multi-stakeholder group is doing right now in that area, the Alliance for, the, for Affordable Internet, uh, which was recently set up uh, last year, run through the World Wide Web Foundation, um, with the participation of many uh, uh, people in the internet community and many firms and trade associations. Um, uh, I think that that kind of effort is the kind of effort that would be important to, to endorse, to further, and to cite as an example of a productive way for the multi-stakeholder model to move forward. Uh, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, actually, I sit on the board of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. It was an idea that originated out of the State Department and is now um, Tim Berners-Lee and, the, and uh, the World Wide Web Foundation is heading up in coordination with, I think, 30 partners, both including governments and and private sector individuals. Uh, so we, we feel very strongly about the Alliance for an Affordable Internet. And clearly the ITU by itself will not be able to further the goal of broadband network deployment around the world. But what the ITU can do is work in partnership with organizations like Alliance for an Affordable Internet to convene the regulatory and policy makers from the developing world to ensure that they get an idea of what best practices are and what other experiments are taking place around the world on the proper regulatory and legal environment to encourage investment and deployment in networks and to assure certainty for investors that their investments uh, will be secure in the, in, the, in, the, in, the going, in the period going forward. We, we actually, I was at the AU recently and we're going to bring a, a group of, um, of policymakers from Africa to participate in a USTTI 
program training on on a variety of things from analog to digital to we're partnering with Chris Painter's shop to provide uh, cybersecurity assistance as well. So these are all these are all important projects. Um, I think we do need to ensure that the developing world doesn't see our uh, support for the multi-stakeholder system as a disengagement from them. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. What we want to see, as I said in my speech, is more inclusion. And we believe that the multi-stakeholder system is an open, it's not a perfect system, it requires evolution, but it is an open system. And we need more participation of developing world governments in this system, but not just developing world governments. We need to ensure that there's a strong and thriving and growing, in some parts, new civil society movement in much of the developing world. And we need to ensure that developing world entrepreneurs are connected to both their governments and the, civil, and the uh, multi-stakeholder institutions that are governing the internet today. I'm Garland McCoy with uh, uh, Technology Education Institute, but also in Vineo, and you know the ambassador and some of the folks up on the panel. I just wanted to uh, strongly endorse this idea that it's sort of, at, at a minimum, high-handed to be uh, uh, making uh, hard and fast pronouncements, whether it's the ITU or others, when you have literally two-thirds of the global community yet having affordable, reliable, uh, access, so inclusion into this. Uh, having met with the, with the people at Affordable, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, Sonia, recently, and others, and seen their great work, study, and the, of course, best practices. But I think one of the things that, that I would offer is that we need more concrete experimentation that is going to this issue of, of open and, and internets at the price points that the, that the Alliance for Affordable Internet and others have, have pointed out are necessary in, in rural areas where the population is in developing countries. I think it can be done, this experimentation on unlicensed and licensed um, uh, platforms, and that um, having some concrete validation of the things that you, Ambassador, and your predecessors, Phil Vivere and David Gross, and even uh, Ambassador Bradley Holmes and others, have been talking about, and, and the private sector people like Pepper and others, but having more examples that we can, that meet the price points that are open, um, I think to sort of push back against the closed architecture that we're seeing creeping along in the, in the developing uh, countries would be a, 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 a good thing, a good ammo, if you will, to have in a positive way going into the planting pot, et cetera. So. Uh, just a couple of things on that. Uh, in the first instance, in terms of affordability, uh, out of the Department of State, uh, within cooperation with USAID, we have the, Bro Glo the Global Broadband Initiative, which partners with NetHope and other uh, nonprofit organizations to do two things. One is they go into developing countries and work with those countries to establish workable universal service funds. And then secondly, NetHope uses grant funding to ensure that NGOs around the world serve as anchor tenants for the deployment of broadband networks in rural communities in very, very poor parts of the world. Uh, we have a number of examples where that works. In the broader sense, um, uh, Patrick Ryan at Google and some others, as well as uh, the Boston Consulting Group, have done some work in looking at what the, the real challenges are to last mile deployment in the developing world and what various technologies there are for ensuring that you can get some form of connectivity in, in, those, in those communities. Uh, and there is really interesting work being done by Microsoft and others using white spaces to achieve those ends. Uh, and there's cooperation and work um, at the ITU on ensuring that there's sufficient spectrum available for these, for, for these efforts. We, we haven't cracked this nut yet, but at the very least, we have to recognize that we've gone from, in 2000, what was 400 million people connected to the internet to what is today 2.7 billion people connected to the internet. I would argue that that pace of connectivity um, reflects extremely well on the stewardship of the deployment of the networks and the attractiveness of the networks to people worldwide. <laughs> and that that stewardship has been conducted by the internet community itself through the multi-stakeholder governance system. While there's an immense amount of work to do, uh, I, would, I think it would be unfair to fail to recognize the achievements to date. And as I said, we fully recognize that there are people around the world who feel like the multi-stakeholder system is not adequate to their needs.
it is incumbent upon us to recognize that, to work with them to understand what those needs are and the degree to which the multi-stakeholder system or anyone else can help them meet those needs. And it's incumbent on them to participate actively in the system, to engage the process. Uh, and so that's, that's the message we're carrying. Um, it really is one of increased openness, increased decentralization, increased diffusion, uh, and increased participation. And we believe that, uh, and I'll tell you, when I, I've been to Latin America now four times, to Africa twice, to Southeast Asia twice, I'll be going again in the near future to each of those places. And there's a real receptivity for a collaborative problem-solving approach to these issues rather than an ideological debate. Uh, because at the end of the day, what public servants want is the ability to have their, their constituents uh, both achieve access and have that done in a secure and safe way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Safili. Just one, just one second. I'm, I'm going to take this question, and then we should go to the panel because these are very yeah. talented and knowledgeable people, and I just like to let yeah. them get their their thoughts out. I will. I will stay until the end. My name is Sir Edward Philly, the new and the newest member of Washington D.C. chapter. Thank you very much for accepting me. I'm the new and the newest member. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, as a student in network and telecommunication, studying here. First, I wish to express my profound thanks and appreciation to the people and government of, for bringing me over here and educating me. Now, I take my country like Sierra Leone. I was a teacher, but back in Africa, and Sierra Leone in particular, the internet is zero. Is zero. If this body can help the government of, of my country, and the continent of Africa to transform the network and telecommunication. Especially, I'm doing a research on one child laptop project so that laptops could be affordable to my brothers and sisters back home. So that they will be totally computer literate. They will not be left behind. As you took this great venture, I would like this body to help my brothers and sisters in the continent of Africa to be computer literate in the internet world. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm sure I understood the question. Um, is it's, If it's relative to, and I think I understand that it's relative to the challenges of both <laughs> access and ability to use that access in Africa. Uh, we are in, in full agreement, and, and as I said, I was just in the African Union, uh, they had a an AU ICT week there to discuss a number of challenges that Africa is facing. So again, in the first instance, the, the current state of play in Africa is that about 16% of Africa's population is connected to the internet, which is a woefully low percentage. Uh, how do you drive down price of access and how do you ensure connectivity? And then once connected, how do you ensure that people uh, can use those tools? I, those are all fair and legitimate questions. In the first instance, connectivity and price really, we believe, depend on competition. And as you see more, sub, more uh, underwater cables reaching the edges of Africa, uh, you see that those price points dropping fairly dramatically. And there were three uh, new underwater cable landings lit up in the last just two years, I think, uh, comparable to before where you had a monopoly system, essentially, of, of cable landings. Then within the, the, then within the continent itself, you have the challenge of bringing those connections inland. And that's going to have to work through a combination of a strong system of internet exchange points as well as collaboration between governments to ensure that networks within one country can connect with networks in other country. Uh, and all of that is, it's not easy, uh, but it's, it's certainly doable. Uh, and there are, there are multiple technical assistance mechanisms that we're going to bring to bear and others, uh, ISOC and others, are bringing to bear to ensure that regulatory and policymakers in the region have an understanding of how those uh, contractual relations can work, and as well as how you can set up an, an internet exchange point and make sure that the information is brought closer to the individual at the end point, thereby in decreasing latency and make increasing the usefulness of the service. The digital literacy challenge is a somewhat more difficult challenge. It will take more time. Uh, but if you connect schools and you connect libraries and you connect healthcare systems, 
at the end of the day, once the utility of the service is proven and people see it, they, they use it. And that's at least what we found in the United States, that it's a combination of both making sure that the service is affordable, but that people see a, its utility. Uh, and, and we found, at least for low-income communities in the United States, and this is probably going to be a function for low-income communities around the world, that a mobile wireless solution is going to have to be a key component of, of the overall solution, as well as public spaces of, of access, so schools and libraries and just public spaces in general, uh, using a combination of Wi-Fi networks and licensed networks, as well as a strong fiber backbone. But I, I fully take your point. At the end of the day, it is our goal to ensure that the internet and ICT in general is a force for bridging divides. It's a force for ensuring that inequality doesn't grow. Uh, it is in the interest of everyone on the network to have more people on the network. It benefits everyone. There is no self-interest in either network operators or any country denying anyone access to the internet. Everyone is actively participating toward that end. We can and should have an honest and honorable discussion and debate about what the best mechanisms are toward that end, how you ensure that capital is made available for infrastructure investments, how you make sure that networks are secure, and how you make sure that at the end point, users are free from an economic and expressive perspective, which is actually a, a, a line I stole from Professor Denardis about expressive and economic liberty, and I use it all the time, so thank you very much. Um, it, it, all of those things are critical to the work that we do. Um, but I, ultimately, my point is that we have shared ends and shared goals, because it is ultimately in the interest of all of us. We have a communal and network interest in having everyone connected to the, to the, to the, to the network itself. Well, thank you, and I'm glad you can stay. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, turn to our panelists, ask them to each talk for five minutes. There is a, a significant uh, online community watching this event, and so when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll try and take as many of the questions as we can from that community as well as the audience. One of the things Ambassador Sepulveda said that I thought was really interesting was he recognized that uh, many people around the world don't feel like the existing structure meets their needs, and that certainly struck me as true. We've recently seen some demonstrations of what an alternate system might look like, which is uh, yesterday uh, China inadvertently made uh, Wyoming the internet capital of the world. <laughs> and um, previously, I don't know if you saw it, there was an article uh, about Brazil's oil industry uh, a couple weeks ago that pointed out that one of the reasons the boom hadn't taken off was that the Brazilian oil company um, is subject to heavy government mandate and to political interference. And so there is an alternative out there, and one of the questions I hope the panel can address is, the alternative may not be as, as efficient, but it might be something that has a little more political weight behind it. How do we manage that transition that you were talking about? How do we move to a new model that preserves the strengths of the multi-stakeholder approach, and yet also meets the political concerns of uh, new internet users. So with that, I think the easiest thing to do is um, go down the end, end with Dave, start with Laura, and take it from there. If you could keep your marks to five minutes, you're going to end up. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, and I wish to thank the Internet Society and the Center for Strategic and International Studies for hosting this. Uh, there is a very important um, geopolitical debate underway about internet governance and infrastructure. We all know that. And uh, the, the first thing I want to say is that the design and the administration of the internet has been, I would suggest, successful. In some ways, we take this for granted, but we can't take this for granted. You know, what we're talking about is a very complex system, not only of technologies, but of institutions and entities, and um, should be very circumspect and um, careful about uh, proposed modifications to the system. The security and stability of the internet, um, I agree, really should rank among other collective action problems on a global level, whether environmental protection, human rights, or other uh, basic concerns about infrastructural systems of water and finance and energy. Because we do have the technical mediation of the public sphere, 
and this technology provides many control points that both affect our civil liberties and also that require coordination. Whether one likes the word governance or not, I usually use small g governance rather than large g gover governance. Uh, the internet does require administration and coordination at many layers. My new book, The Global War for Internet Governance, uh, tries to examine the various layers of how the internet is already coordinated and what some of the debates are that are shaping the future of internet innovation and freedom. There really are layers upon layers of governance, you know, too lengthy to get into here, whether we're talking about the management of critical internet resources, interconnection and routing, cybersecurity governance, uh, standard setting, the policy making role of private companies, and of course intellectual property rights enforcement. These aren't necessarily neutral control points, even though there's, many of them are technological, and a primary theme of my book is that internet governance conflicts are becoming the new spaces where geopolitical power, economic power is unfolding in the 21st century. Now, many of these conflicts are a proxy for other issues and other forms of political and economic conflict. So they're entering into the internet administration debate, but often um, you know, about something completely different. Much of the work currently is done by private industry and institutions such as ICANN and the IETF. You know, much of this has nothing to do with traditional governments, and as I said, it's uh, working fairly well. But um, several controversies have really, as you know, brought this issue into the public sphere. Is it fewer than four years since we've had uh, the WikiLeaks Cablegate saga? We had Hillary Clinton's internet freedom speech, and then you know, several years later, the, um, the cognitive dissonance between that and the disclosures about the NSA's digital surveillance. We had the, the WICIT, it's a lot of acronyms, right? The World Conference on International Telecommunications raised concerns about a so-called United Nations takeover of the internet and concerns around that. And we've had the Egyptian internet outages, we had the online boycott over the Stop Online Privacy Act, I could go on and on and on. GhostNet, the Great Firewall of China, and too many distributed denial of service attacks to recount. So I understand um, and, and f appreciate and share the, all of the attention to this. It's brought it into the public sphere. It's brought it in front of policymakers. So at the very same time that we have a complete dependence on cyber infrastructure, we have a loss of trust in the stewardship of governments. To some extent, I'm trying to overstate this just a little bit, but by default, some loss of trust and concern in the private institutions that manage the internet, whether founded or not. So out of this loss of trust in all of these political issues has come a, a lot of political attention on internet governance. And uh, Danny did a great job of explaining what some of the upcoming um, events are and issues. So uh, one thing that I want to mention, I think the main point I'll make is, has to do with this multi-stakeholder issue. I wrote a paper recently with a colleague of mine, Dr. Mark Raymond, called Thinking Clearly About Multi-Stakeholder Internet Governance. And what I'd like to do right now is just to raise a few caveats about how this term is used. First, this issue is sometimes elevated as a value in and of itself, rather than as a possible approach to achieve actual goals such as um, preserving the Internet's interoperability, stability, security, or openness. Second, multi-stakeholder governance may not be appropriate in every functional task of the internet. I laid out in this paper about 144 tasks of internet governance, and there are more. Now, keeping the internet operational requires many different coordinating functions, and I would suggest that some are appropriately relegated to the state, others are appropriately relegated to the private sector, and others are appropriately relegated to multi-stakeholder institutions, such as ICANN and the IETF. So not every area needs to be multi-stakeholder. Third, uh, the concept of multi-stakeholderism sometimes, and we see this increasingly, serves as a proxy for these broader political struggles that have nothing to do with internet governance. You can see uh, repressive information policies from governments advocating for top-down multi-stakeholderism, What's the role of civic society in that? What is the role of the private industry in that? You know, to, uh, governments trying to seek additional power. You can see companies and other actors 
who are, have a vested interest in current arrangements, seeking to preserve that and possibly exclude new entrants. A lot of the battles that are happening don't necessarily have to do with the coordination of the internet, but they're there nonetheless, and often under the mantle of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, fourth caveat, the term sometimes refers to discourses about internet governance rather than the actual practice of internet governance. So I always like to say that while we're busy attending all of these events, such as the Internet Governance Forum, the actual practice of coordinating and keeping the internet operational, uh, something which I appreciate a great deal because I need my Reddit and I need to be online a lot, um, it, it, the, the actual practice continues to occur. Fifth, and my fifth and final caveat is that the concern over multi-stakeholder internet governance, it often uh, focuses around uh, discussions over the functions that are performed by ICANN, which is obviously a very critical issue because of the need to ensure uh, globally stable and unique names and numbers. But that these functions are really only part of the technical and political coordination that is necessary for the internet's operation. So I want to suggest that the phrase needs a lot of unpacking, that multi-stakeholderism is too often employed uniformly. Part of this has to do with the view that internet governance is a single thing. We get asked the strange non sequitur questions, who should control the internet? ICANN, the US government, the United Nations, Google. The question makes no sense on its face, and it stems from the misconception that internet governance is a single thing rather than a multi-layered uh, coordinating series of functions that keep the internet operational. So the, point, the, the single point I'd like to make is that internet governance is not one system, that, that multi-stakeholderism in turn should not be viewed as a value in and of itself applied homogeneously to internet governance functions but rather um, asking the question of the appropriate approach to responsible and efficacious internet governance, um, what, what is optimal in promoting other values such as interoperability, civic inclusion, innovation, free expression, as Danny said, economic liberty in any particular functional and political context. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to the other remarks. Thank you, uh, Dick. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim and, and David, and thank, uh, I'd like to express my appreciation to the Internet Society for this opportunity. I find myself in a very comfortable position because I'm following Ambassador Sepulveda, who's had, I thought, a rather remarkable articulation of U.S. policy, and I want to express my appreciation to him for that. And then, of course, Professor Donardis, who I have been following for some time, her reading, her writings, so I'm in a very comfortable position to follow those two speakers to then indicate what I intend to speak about, and that is um, the context, if you will, of the U.S. government's position over time. And then I want to draw certain conclusions from that as to what we may see in the next five or six years, all of it tied into the theme of the panel, which is the geopolitics of Internet governance. Um, it strikes me as I, as I kind of reviewed a few things before this panel, the remarkable continuity over time of the U.S. government's position. And, um, and it is a remarkable continuity over three distinct periods that I will, for the purpose of this panel and five minutes of presentation, summarize as being the last uh, periods of time over 100 years from the telegraph to telecommunications to the Internet. The United States government has maintained a rather remarkable, as I say, consistent position. And during these periods, which have been variously referred to as technology inflection points, um, we can also, in a geopolitical sense, certainly accept that, uh, but also combine that notion with something more closely related to a kind of diplomatic collision uh, as a result of uh, the introduction of new technology. Um, in the 19, uh, from uh, the early 20th century up through the 1930s when the telegraph was preeminent, the United States held to a position uh, which was that um, they would not sign, the government would not sign the International Telegraph 
Convention. Why? Because we said uh, we maintain a private uh, telegraph uh, service and that uh, those who are signing this agreement uh, most uh, often are government entities and that we do not believe that in some ways that we can enter into this agreement uh, and obligate our private uh, providers. So it was not until 1948 that the United States finally signed the treaty uh, uh, related uh, to telegraph. There was, another there was another side story to that, of course, in which is that the United States was resisting what appeared to be by some the monopoly of Marconi and uh, the United Kingdom on the transmission of telegraph uh, service. But nonetheless, that notion that we provide telegraph by private entities and not government was the sustaining view uh, through that period. And then finally, in 48, as I say, we signed it. And then in the 19, uh, moving to the telecommunications, you see the same sort of consistency, which is the United States resisting monopoly uh, provision of telecommunication. In this sense, it was the United States again confronting the United Kingdom through cable and wireless, who maintained a tight hold on all communications in and between uh, the empire, the British Empire. The United States threatened a price war with the United Kingdom and cable and wireless by offering under, to undercut their pricing. This resulted uh, in ultimately the arrangement in 1945 called so-called Bermuda Agreement. But the U.S. at that time, uh, um, uh, as I say, maintained a position uh, of uh, being anti-monopolist, but also encouraging uh, competition. I will grant you there was some idealism in that. There was also a considerable amount of self-interest. And then we move uh, to the, uh, if quickly to the internet era. And I think that one of the points that I'd like to uh, depart from in terms of explaining that uh, position is to also recognize that the United States did not sign the telecommunications annex, otherwise what ultimately became known as the International Telecommunications Regulations, until 1973. And the reason was that it was essentially only for Europe. Now, if you wish to join the European system, you were able to do so, and many countries did, including China uh, and India. But the United States uh, chose a position which said that unless it's internationalized, uh, we will not uh, participate. It started then a succession of conferences from 73 to 88 to the Wicked in 2012, where the United States um, rode other events um, and which influenced its position in those conferences. Uh, certainly the privatization and liberalization of telecommunications uh, up through the 80s influenced significantly the U.S. position in 1988 at the WOTC uh, and, and um, then of course in the wicket of 2012 the positions that the United States and Ambassador Sepulveda has so wonderfully articulated uh, influenced uh, and informed the U.S. position uh, with respect uh, to that conference. Now, throughout this period, there have been times in which the United States has taken positions that were um, um, rather direct, as in, this, in the case, of course, of not signing treaties for purposes of, of, of principle. Uh, I would also note that during this period of the early 80s, the United States left UNESCO um, essentially uh, in protest to the New World Information Order. And what was the issue there? The issue was the movement towards giving states rights to access to communication and not individuals. I want to note that because in the wicket, in the preamble to the, to the, to the final acts that came out of Dubai, that, uh, that was a major debate of the, uh, in which the United States indicated that it would not accept the shift, the fundamental shift of international law from, uh, from individuals to states in terms of rights. You will note uh, that in the preamble of the final acts there is a reference uh, to the right of states of access to communications. And, and that was, at the time of UNESCO, one of the reasons the United States <coughs> left uh, that institution. So uh, let me now then come to certain conclusions based on what I have seen in terms of the overall U.S. Uh, positions. Uh, first of all, um, I would assert that what we're entering into is an intensified period 
of diplomatic activity. Uh, and I would also like to say that these conclusions in many ways reflect what has been the historical precedent over these three periods of technology uh, inflections. Uh, that in each of those three periods, telegraph, telecommunications, and internet, there is eventually an intensifying diplomatic activity, an attempt to internationally to arrive at certain norms. Um, at the same time that there, there will be a variety of institutions that ultimately get involved in this activity. This was true in all three uh, instances. Uh, what we refer to as multi-stakeholder is, it seems to me, uh, as Professor Denardis has indicated, it has many meetings, but it certainly has one meeting uh, that it, it resonates with me, which is to say that uh, you, as technology expands, the inclusiveness of those participating in the technology necessarily also expands. The political consequence of that is you need to accommodate the new inclusiveness. So that's the second point. Um, I would also say there's a third point, and this was true also in all three instances, that national security um, becomes, uh, the, and, and technology developments and evolution and foreign policy uh, arrive at the same uh, nexus. Uh, it was not too long ago that countries argued that you could not trade telecommunication services because they were essential to national security. The current national uh, debate <clears throat> on issues of surveillance, it seems to me, are a reflection of the fact that that nexus remains as to how to, uh, how to deal with national security as well as the evolving uh, technology. The, the fourth point I'd make is that in, every th in all three instances, regardless of the collision of diplomatic forces and, and geopolitics surrounding the evolution of technology, the technology is it, of it itself continued to expand and the infrastructure w w expanded undeterred by the politics of the moment. And, and that's certainly what we're seeing. Uh, my colleague in the audience who reflected upon the, the, the low rate of internet access uh, in Africa, one must also say as a balancing comment that it's remarkable the impact of mobile uh, on providing internet access in Africa. And despite the fact that the, the baseline is low, the greatest growth rates, as anyone providing those services would tell you, is now uh, in Africa. Um, and then I would say my last point is this. Um, <clears throat> the reflection of the, of the first two periods of history is also beginning to be reflected in this third period, uh, which is uh, do not expect a quick fix. There is not going to be one silver bullet. There is not going to be one position that transforms all arguments. We are now in a new normal, and the new normal is this period of collision of forces uh, with considerable uh, infrastructure build out, but it, this will be um, the future. But as in all previous instances, there is ultimately uh, uh, decisions made and agreements reached with respect to norms. There will be a variety of international agreements uh, going forward, um, and that uh, the nation state becomes a, an important part in that puzzle, but it cannot be uh, alone. And in that context, uh, I would note that um, uh, the President's announcement uh, with respect uh, on, on uh, Friday, the January 17th, uh, it had to be noted that there was a reference to the creation within the Department of State, uh, a senior position uh, to deal with uh, some of the issues uh, that are being, um, uh, that are being uh, discussed uh, today and Ambassador Sepulveda uh, referenced them, uh, which means to me that the Department of State, which is uh, the principal organization within the government that deals with international norms, international treaties, the protection of U.S. sovereignty will play a very important role in this, in this period uh, of intensified diplomatic uh, activity. Thank you very much. Hi. I realized that uh, you guys at CSIS were trying to figure out how to make my name sound more Russian. So instead of Veni, it's Vani now. So it's a mixture between Veni and Ivan, I guess. Uh, but thank you. I'm really honored, actually, to be here, regardless of that spelling mistake. Uh, I also want to 
ask or beg for your pardon for my non-native English speaking accent, uh, being the only one on the panel who is actually uh, born in a country that doesn't exist any longer, <laughs> uh, which is Yugoslavia. Uh, but um, that brings me to the point which um, everyone talks about internet governance. The word governance cannot be translated in certain languages. So when we talk about governance in certain countries, they think about government, because that's the, that's the body that actually governs something. Uh, so I can, I'm vice president of ICANN, responsible for Russia, CIS, Eastern Europe. Uh, ICANN is an international organization which, uh, due to historical reason, was founded in Marino del Rey in California. Um, when I say international, I actually mean it is an international, truly international organization if you look at uh, the way it's organized and the way it functions. It's not an international treaty organization like the, some of the ones that uh, Ambassador Sepulveda mentioned in the beginning, like the ITU or UNESCO. But we do work uh, in cooperation with uh, many international treaty organizations. Uh, UNESCO is a good example, the ITU also is a good example, because uh, regardless of what you read in the newspapers, uh, ICANN and the ITU do have some good working relationship. Uh, the president of ICANN spoke at the Wicked, uh, this abbreviation which uh, still is causing some people to raise their eyebrows, and also at the WTPF, the World Telecommunication Policy Forum last year in Geneva, and there are meetings coming this year, and I'm sure that both uh, Fadi Shihari, the president of ICANN, and Hamadun Toure, the secretary general of the ITU, will exchange some uh, speaking slots on each other's meetings. Uh, we do also work with the business community, and we may, most of the people really outside of the narrow um, registry slash registrar related to domain names, most of the people really don't know that ICANN exists. They don't know who is this, or which is this organization, where is it based, why do we need an organization to coordinate the domain name system and to coordinate the uh, IP address allocation and all these technical aspects, uh, which actually is not bad. Because I think if many people knew that ICANN exists, that means ICANN is not doing its job. And it's almost like the phone company. You never, I bet you, that you never call 611 or whatever is your uh, customer support and tell them, hey guys, thanks, my phone is working today. But you will definitely call them if you cannot dial a number. You'll find another phone and you'll start calling. So we ended up in this debate about internet governance, which uh, really started many, many years ago. Uh, we ended up in this debate without necessarily being uh, willing to do so. But we ended up also because, as some of the previous speakers pointed out, and I'm sure some of the next ones will also mention, um, s there is a certain perception what ICANN is, there is a certain perception of what ICANN is not, and there is a, an understanding of what Internet governance is. Now, this is for those of you who are online for many years. They know that if you enter, if, and maybe also for the people who are uh, doing debates offline, not on the Internet, you know that if you enter a discussion with an opinion, it's inevitable that you will end the discussion with the same opinion. It's very difficult to change somebody's opinion. And if somebody comes to ICANN, for example, with the opinion that this is a US government control organization, it's almost impossible to change it. The people already have this opinion. They'll try to defend it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna spend, because we only have five minutes, and I know that there is a time for Q&A, I'm not going to spend, spend time explaining why ICANN is not a U.S. government control organization. Um, but if somebody wants, we can talk after the, uh, the, con the session is over about it. But I can also say that ICANN is not the organization that actually um, creates the way the Internet is running. It's, many people say, well, ICANN created all these new generic top-level domains. It's actually not quite correct. ICANN is a very complex structure. There are a lot of supporting organizations, which actually are the ones uh, that keep ICANN working. And 
and the community, the users, the people who actually want to do some business in this area, they're the ones who create uh, the policies and then take them through the ICANN process so that at the end the board uh, accepts it. And by the way, the chairman of the board, Steve Crocker, is uh, in the audience, so if there are people who want to ask him some questions, they can use the opportunity. We, we also ask and urge people to join ICANN and participate in what ICANN does. We reach out to countries, organizations, and individuals, and I mentioned some of the businesses that are within ICANN. Uh, we also try to engage other organizations which are outside of the usual suspects, outside of the box, so to speak. Um, I'll give you an example with my own uh, country, Bulgaria. Uh, there is a whole program within ICANN uh, where we bring people from developing countries uh, to ICANN to see what it is, how it functions, and it's a very open process. It's going through a public consultation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was a Bulgarian lady from a university, a professor at the university, who applied to get a, a grant to come to one of the ICANN meetings. So she, she came, and she was startled to see all these, you know, like 2,000 people in Beijing, or 3,000 people, and talking about this internet thing. And this was last year in March or April. And then in the summer, she wrote me and said, well, you know, I want to do something in my university. I want to do something about internet governance and cyber security, and I said, that's fine, you know, we'll, I'll support it whatever way I can, and two weeks later, she sent me a description of a program for the master's degree students in her university on internet governance, and if I knew what I'm getting into, I would have probably said no in the beginning, but I ended up sp lecturing students in December, and I brought more colleagues from ICANN and also outside of ICANN, so that's where we showed what what it actually means to be part of this internet governance process. Now, these 35 students or so, if few of them decide that they will get into the debate about internet governance, that's actually good, because these are new people from uh, part of the world which is usually not um, participating actively within ICANN. Many people think that ICANN is um, kind of oriented towards business only. Uh, it's not true. Uh, business is only part of ICANN. We also are looking to include academia, non-profits, civil society, and governments. There are currently more than 130 members of the Governmental Advisory Committee of ICANN. And one may argue that there are more coming, and yes, there are more governments that are joining uh, as we speak. And we try to show to the world that not only this multi-stakeholder model, by the way, another word, which is untranslatable in certain languages, multi-stakeholder. In all honesty, I can't translate it in English, too. <laughs> but, but we want to show them that it is possible for the governments, the private sector, the citizens to sit down on the same table and reach to a conclusion which is good for everyone. Like such a conclusion would be, for example, what do we do with uh, internationalized domain names? These are domain names that are written in script, which is different from the Latin. And I can tell you that uh, in many countries, and I know we take this for granted uh, in this audience here and maybe on the webcast, uh, but in many countries, people don't understand Latin. I mean, just imagine for a second, and I'll end up with that, if the internet was not created in the US by people like Stephen, Vincent, and Bob Kahn. What if the internet was created in a country which script we uh, I'm coming from a Cyrillic country script. Well, the people who understand Cyrillic or Latin don't get at all what it was in Japan or China or Korea. Could you really write google.com in another script which you don't understand? Or would you ever, ever, be, to ever be able to learn a different language just for the sake of writing uh, a domain name? So there are all of these new opportunities that are coming for the rest of the people. You mentioned the number. How many people are today online? 2.7 billion? Well, there are 4. Point, who knows, 5, maybe more now, billion who are not. And uh, perhaps uh, a huge portion of those people uh, don't really understand English. And we want to make sure that they can use the internet the same way we do. So anyway, I'll be ready to answer questions at the end. Thanks. I'm Michael Nelson. I'm a uh, 
principal technology policy strategist at Microsoft, and in my spare time for the last five years, I've been teaching at Georgetown in the Communications Culture and Technology Program. Uh, even though I'm a physicist and a futurist, I'm going to spend most of my time talking today about communication, not communications. I'm going to talk about communication that will help us explain what we're doing here and how we can develop a better system for Internet governance. Uh, some of you were in the room a couple months ago when we did a recap of the Internet Governance Forum in Bali. Uh, this was another Internet Society DC event. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, weren't there, the webcast is very good and it kind of talks about where we are today and what happened in Bali. I think this meeting is unique because we are trying to look ahead five, six years to where we could be. And uh, I, I think there are some opportunities, as Dick said, as we go through this inflection, to do things much better than we have been and to get to a much more stable uh, situation. When I first got involved in Internet governance, uh, I was a little frustrated because I felt Internet governance should just focus on the Internet layer itself. That we, you know, and people kept bringing in all these other issues. Uh, they wanted to talk about not just network issues and domain name issues, they wanted to talk about web standards and cloud and apps and social media. And I finally come to realize that there's no way we're going to separate the upper layers of things that run on the Internet from the Internet itself, and that we are going to have this broad discussion about Internet governance. And as we do that, we need to understand where the different countries and companies and institutions involved in this debate are coming from. As technologists and policy wonks who are focused on Internet issues, sometimes we, we miss the bigger picture. And I think it's useful just to, to, to realize that when you talk to a lot of the people at meetings on Internet governance, they're concerned about other things. Uh, often countries are motivated by money. How can they protect the network providers in their country? How can they make more money? They're certainly concerned about media. The Arab countries in particular have seen how social media helped spur the, the Arab Spring, and China is very worried about uh, how the Internet can spread uh, discord and, and uh, empower dissidents. We have a whole issue about national security, which Ambassador Sepulveda mentioned, and a lot of countries are driven by their desire to make sure that the information going over the network is secure and that the private and protected and then there's the concern about crime. But what really drives a lot of politicians is what voters are telling them. And so voters are complaining about fraud, identity theft, pornography. In many countries, porn is the largest source of bits, and it, it's seen as disrupting the traditional culture. Uh, lack of access, high prices for you know, internet is certainly very high on, among the items that people are concerned about. But when you get down to it, the, overarching issue in country after country is jobs and economic growth. And that's where I think we really need to do a better job of linking what we're talking about here to their number one priority, which is making sure these countries can create the millions of jobs that are going to be needed to keep people off unemployment. I think this is a very exciting time for the Internet if we can change the discussion. The old discussion has been around the old model of, of media regulation. You go to an ITU meeting and you hear, well, the Internet's just like telephones, broadcast, and it's maturing now, so it's time it be regulated like these old media. That's the wrong frame. We need to think about the Internet and, and the computing power that it provides and the information it provides as one of the raw inputs to the economy, something as fundamental as the computer on your desk, the paper you use to, to publish reports, the talent you hire. These are fundamental things that every sector of the economy needs. And we can't treat the internet and the cloud as just one more niche application. When you look at the whole package right now, we're building on top of this wireless broadband infrastructure the global internet which is enabling the cloud, which is enabling the cloud of things, which will soon have tens of hundreds of billions of devices. And we're making it all work together in a seamless way, using better interfaces that allow anybody, even people who are literate, to access information. 
So we're on the cusp of, of something that's even bigger than the web was in the 1990s or e-commerce was in the last decade. And we as, an, as a community need to do a better job of explaining to a broader community what this is all about and how the opportunities we're building and the decisions we're making are going to enable these new startups, new innovation. We talked earlier about getting a more diverse group into the debate and discussion about internet governance. That's, inc that's incredibly important, but it's also important to get a more diverse group of government policymakers in the room. This has been a debate mostly attended to by telecom regulators and people who work with them. We need the economics minister in the room, the finance minister, the labor minister, the education minister, the research minister, and it really would be nice if we had more prime ministers in the room. Because these are the people who are going to look beyond the narrow needs of the telecom industry and look at the real impact of these technologies. And we have to reach out to them, explain to them what's going on, and not just national policymakers, but governors and mayors. They're the ones who are closest to the ground, and they're the ones most concerned about unemployment. Let me finish by just giving you some homework. First off, uh, reminding you that uh, we do have a hashtag for this event, just ISOCDC. And if you put at CSIS, you'll probably get even more people to notice. Um, I have three things I'd like to ask of you. One, our team at, the, at Microsoft, the Technology Policy Group, is working on visions of the future, explaining how these technologies are going to come together, how they're going to solve people's problems. I would love to hear examples of visions that you've read for five, ten years from now that could inform our discussion. So find me on Twitter at Mike Nelson, or you can send me email at Mr. Nelson, mrnelson, at microsoft.com. Second piece of homework is several people in the room and on this panel are members of the MAG, the advisory committee that's helping set the program for the Internet Governance Forum in Istanbul this fall. So put your hand up if you're on the MAG. Give us some ideas, ideas for things that we should put on the agenda for the next meeting. And then the last very easy piece of homework for about half of you, join the Internet Society. Mm -hmm. This is incredibly easy, it's free, and you'll get access to all sorts of very interesting information on what's going on in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Might I add, and the DC chapter. It's a, it's a great uh, entree point. Um, uh, I'm Sally Wentworth, I'm Senior Director of um, Policy for the Internet Society. Uh, I'm on staff of the Internet Society, uh, working on global policy issues, uh, and so I, I, I do want to say uh, a hearty congratulations to CSIS and our DC chapter for putting this kind of substantive event together and encouraging this kind of dialogue. It's exactly uh, the kind of discussion that needs to happen. I also want to note that um, our chapters are made up of volunteers, people who care deeply about the subject and deeply about um, the mission of, of a global internet. And people like David and Mike and Venny and Judith and others here have put a tremendous amount of time into strengthening the chapter. And I'm just uh, going to make a plug for you to, to really do get involved. It's, it's an opportunity to, to shape the discussion here in Washington. Uh, in thinking about this, it's difficult to come last. You feel like you're going to just agree with what everything, <laughs> what everyone said before you and try to say it differently. So I'll see if I can succeed in that. Uh, as I think about this, and the, the question was, what's the geopolitics of internet governance? You think back to 2003, 2005, there was the World Summit on the Information Society. Uh, which really was sort of a, a first global international consensus on how the internet and how information technology can interact with society. And while a lot of the focus these days on, on thinking about WISIS goes back to three or four key paragraphs dealing with internet governance, I do think it's important to step back and look at uh, the, the Tunis agenda look at the Geneva Declaration of Principles, and you will see a tremendous amount of optimism about what the internet means for um, politics, what it means for 
uh, the economy, what it means for competitiveness, the challenges of, of bringing more people in. Um, and you know, I was in the, the U.S. government at the time, and what we um, really saw, and I think even um, within the U.S. government itself, was governments trying to figure out how to interact with this technology that was shaping every aspect of their, um, their government, their, their citizenry, uh, their economy, but not quite knowing how to do it and being confronted with a whole series of new acronyms that made um, relatively little sense to them. Um, you know, terms like IETF and regional internet registries and ICANN and all of these acronyms and, and, and thinking, well, it, it works, but we want to understand this better and we want more of it. That's a great thing. And so if you look at WISIS, you saw an international consensus that was incredibly optimistic, I think, and, and quite positive. And with respect to governance, they noted that that's a relevant issue. Um, they noted that it should be inclusive and multi-stakeholder. Uh, but I think they also left some questions about um, how to really make this inclusive, how do governments really interact and uh, things like the Internet Governance Forum were stood up in part to help think about that question further, um, as well as other processes within the UN and elsewhere. I do know at the Internet Society, the, um, the idea of how, how to answer this question of the interaction between policy and the technology uh, shaped a lot of our activities uh, following the WISIS. Um, what does it mean for access prices to have a multi-stakeholder process? When you set up an internet exchange point, is this something that the government drops on its country or is this something that really does emerge from the community? And these were hard questions uh, that, the, that I think a lot of us in the community um, wrestled with as the internet continued to grow at a magnificent pace. As the geopolitical situation changed at the same time as all of this was going on. We had the emergence of new economies. We had um, a, a massive international recession, economic recession. Uh, we had some of the shocks to the system, I think, that Laura talked about in terms of, um, what is it, WikiLeaks and the SOPA um, debate here in the U.S. Uh, more recently, the Wicket, I think, was um, a real policy um, shock to the system, and then, of course, the revelations more recently. I think what all of that tells us is, and I truly believe that that optimism that we saw at WISA still exists, but there's a question, again, emerging and an opportunity for policymakers to use some of the traditional venues that they've used in the past that the ambassador and, and Dick Baird spoke about of what to answer some of those questions that they felt didn't get answered in 2003 and 2005, and in part to respond to some of these shocks to the system that we've seen more recently. And I think the question for, for those of us in the internet community is, you know, how do we not lose sight of what we were, what we're all trying to achieve here? A global interoperable network of networks that enables innovation, that enables connectivity, free expression, but that also recognizes um, the local context and the local challenge and allows for that fluidity, that allows for, for people to move in and out of the ecosystem um, to affect it. And, and what's the policy environment in which that can happen? I think one of the things that concerns me as I hear some of the discussions lately is that we're talking about a new thing and, and I think as humans, we tend to want to put boxes up and, and put people into boxes and say, okay, you live in this box, go forth and do what you do in that box. But the internet doesn't work like that. The standards world interacts with um, the content layers, which interact with the social layers. It's, it's a fluid system. And the policy responses to that, I think, um, as, as Dick was saying, are going to have to take that into account um, going forward. But how do we, as an internet community, not lose sight of that, um, that optimism and those objectives 
while at the same time uh, recognizing that, the, as, as this panel um, title suggests, the geopolitics of the internet are changing. Maybe an interesting question is how can the internet continue to change the geopolitics um, in ways that are positive and constructive? Okay, great. Dave has a question or two, which we'll get to, but I'm going to try and summarize the panel in an inflammatory way. Uh, so what, what did I hear? Um, well, I heard that the, the Internet works pretty well, and the institutions we have now um, do some things really well. Um, but I also heard that there are some things it doesn't do really well, and that there's a fair amount of the world's population that is uh, dissatisfied with the current structure. Right? So we have sometimes talked about competing narratives for what the internet should look like in the future. Didn't talk about that here, but I don't know if there's competing narratives really. There might be uh, one narrative that is uh, eroding or degrading and other people thinking about what a new narrative would look like, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, the Brazilians. Um, we didn't talk about what the role of the UN will be, and sort of an easy trick in, in diplomacy is to say if there's <clears throat> a set of positions, pick the one in the middle, right? Mm. And that's probably where we're going to drive. So what are the positions? There are some countries that feel that government should play a stronger role and that internet governance should be anchored in the UN system somehow. I would probably say that's a majority opinion, but not a complete majority. There's other governments who rightly point out that the existing model has worked really well, that there's risks to moving to a more government-centric model, not only political risks, but economic risks, and those are very legitimate concerns. I think they're actually right. Um, so what's the middle look like? Where do we end up with a, a new system that will, and I, think, I don't remember if it was Dick or who, will accommodate all these new users? I'll do a little self-advertisement here. We're going to come out with a report in a week uh, written for the European Union on uh, norms and uh, international agreement that will touch on some of these issues. Um, my sense is, though, we have not yet figured out, and in some ways you can't figure out until you start the discussions, where that midpoint is. Big countries don't give up. So we're not going to suddenly say, okay, we surrender, you know, give it to the ITU. Similarly, uh, the other countries that have differing views are not going to say, we agree, the status quo, let's keep it. So what's that midpoint? Um, that might be a good one for people to talk about. Um, I don't know how we want to do this. Dave, do you want to start with questions? We had a question in the audience, and I think we had a couple questions online. Go ahead. I'll start with a question. Our panel spoke brilliantly about the challenges to Internet governance, about what's been, accom uh, what's been accomplished, about the complexity of internet governance, about how multi-stakeholderism is a value not always appropriate or not always relative to specific functions, and about how technology seems to evolve no matter what. I'd like to ask the panelists to give a few examples of when institutions should get out of the way and let the internet evolve, and a few other examples of when we need institutions to be active to guide the internet forward. I'll dive in on that. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm glad you asked that question because I, I think this question of the narrative, the example, is really important. And, and I touched a little bit on this in my remarks. We need to tell people that this is a different system. I, I like to compare the Internet to paper. We don't have any paper governance organizations. Nobody's deciding how big your pieces of paper have to be. There are norms. Different countries have different ones, but no one defines how you use paper. Um, <clears throat> so I think we have to start looking for examples where a unregulation approach has worked, as with paper. Um, here in the U.S., we used to have very strict rules on how much you could charge to move fre freight from one place to another. We had a huge bureaucracy down on Pennsylvania Avenue, the Interstate Commerce Commission which was in the business of telling truckers how much to charge for moving freight. And Jimmy Carter, the great deregulator, got rid of that because they were able to show that by having 
information posted on tariffs, by having a competitive market, we could create a better governance system. I think we can do that for a lot of places on the Internet, whether it's domain names or peering or some of the higher level issues I mentioned earlier. More transparency, more data, particularly with all the great big data tools we have today, enable us to build systems that are self-regulatory or unregulatory. Um, so that, that's I, I, it's a really foreign idea for people who have made their whole career regulating things. But we can tell that story, and we can show examples of where the system has worked really well without creating big new structures like Sally said. And conversely, Laura or Dick, can you give a few examples of where institutions need to be more active? Certainly, there are many uh, issues of internet governance that require a lot of attention. Uh, one area is, I'll just raise these in the form of a question. The future of interoperability. This has been a core value of internet design, and uh, we increasingly see a resurgence of proprietary values and proprietary technology. So we don't have the same openness in newer applications, including voice including cloud computing that we've had in other areas. So I think that, you know, attention to interoperability. Um, do we want regulation of interconnection and what will that do to the pace of innovation and growth? I'm concerned about fragmentation. We have a lot of national proposals to, uh, to create trenches and uh, demarcations. What will that do to the universal internet? The issue of privacy. This is not just uh, about government surveillance either, but the large ID infrastructure that uh, is collected from private industry. You know, what is the future of privacy in this environment? And increasing uh, calls around the world to go with IDs to get online. What about content regulation? I'm sure we'll see continued proposals for governments to regulate spam um, and other forms of content, which requires deep packet inspection and looking at the actual content. Is that the future that we want? And of course, the security of the infrastructure. I wanted to mention that just yesterday at the World Economic Forum in Davos it was the official launch of a global commission on internet governance that is going to look at exactly these questions. Um, and there are other very good initiatives out there too to create dialogues around this. Uh, the commission is going to be led by uh, Carl Bildt, who is Sweden's current Minister of Foreign Affairs and includes a lot of highly respected global figures. And just disclosure, I'll actually be surging, uh, serving as the research director for that initiative. Uh, and it's being spearheaded by a couple of think tanks. And um, Jim, I, I know you're very familiar with this. But so I, I just want to say, even though the internet is working fairly well, there are all of these issues that re require attention, whether privacy, security, interconnection, interoperability, and continuing the openness of the internet. It's not guaranteed what the future of the internet will be. So attention has to be paid to these issues. I'm glad you gave us some good news, Laura, because that was five nightmare scenarios in two minutes. Um, we had a question in the audience, and then I see we have a couple questions. So we have multiple questions. Uh, go ahead. Can Hi, uh, my name is Donna Wells. Uh, my background is I spent a lot of time researching and analyzing the Russian language internet as a separate entity. Um, I have a theoretical question about the nature of the internet. And today, the internet is comprised of several sub-entities demarcated by the language in which the content is found. These different sub-entities have their peculiar nature. They have different characteristics, different dynamics. So my question is, do we think that over time, the internet is trending toward more uniformity? Are these sub-entities losing their peculiarities? Or actually, are these different sub-entities, such as the Russian language internet, Chinese language internet, actually becoming more peculiar in nature, more divergent? Thank you. I'll dive into that. Some of our students at Georgetown in the Communications, Culture, and Technology program have looked at this question. And one of the theses that I remember most about, uh, covers how web design varies from Latin America to China to the U.S. Uh, and it is, it's, it's fascinating to see how, partly because of the structure of the language, partly because of the cultural ad antecedents, there's very different approaches. It's not just the language, it's the whole way that information is presented. And all indications are, are that we're getting more diversity as more and more 
corners of the country of the world get connected. If you look at uh, what the percentage of websites in English uh, over the last 15 years, it's steadily gone down. Multilingual domain names make it easier for people to find content in non-Latin scripts, as Vinny said. So I, I don't think we're, we're, we're not leading to the Hollywoodization of the world. Uh, I think just the opposite. People are going to be able to discover the joys of music from Chad or Sri Lanka, and you suddenly have a global audience for culture that, until that point, was kind of segregated in its own little cultural group with maybe a million or two million people speaking that language and understanding it. Mike, um, you're a futurist, so I'm going to interject here with a question. I don't worry about this too much because one of the things that I think we've both thought for a long time is that um, software cures all ills, <clears throat> right? And so you'll have a very diverse internet with multiple languages, multiple scripts, and we won't have to worry about it because there'll be some program that translates it into our native tongue. So at the end of the day, we might end up, it won't be next year, it might not be five years, but I bet you'll be within 10 years. We might end up back with no technical or linguistic impediments to a single web. And I say that because it appears to me that global demand is for that kind of broad access. You're the futurist, what do you think? Uh, I don't have to be a futurist on this one. I can just visit the Microsoft Research Labs. <laughs> and we, we've, got, we've got some amazing stuff that's already out there and some even more amazing stuff that I can't talk about. Um, but it does make Siri look like a second grader. Uh, it's really, <laughs> it's very impressive technology. I, but I, I, Mr. still, Mr. Chairman, I ask that we strike that remark. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I am also a cyber optimist, uh, and I, I do think that uh, we're going to allow people to find some of these other types of content. But we're also going to help people learn other languages faster. I mean, there's some really powerful new tools for doing that too. One in the front, and then we'll go left to right. Uh, good morning. Uh, Philip Corwin, and a, and a question for Professor Denardo. So I'm glad you brought out the commission. Uh, uh, many of us were surprised at that press release yesterday from Davos. I wonder if you could give us some more background on what led to the creation of this commission, the selection of the members. I note that many of the members are one is uh, very well associated with the upcoming meeting in Brazil. Others are from, uh, also serve on roles on these high-level uh, policy panels set up by ICANN. But I guess, how does the commission's work uh, fit into everything else that's going on in internet governance? And do you feel confident that the, all these other fours in which these issues are being discussed will be receptive to the Commission's output, what I know is going to be a two-year program, and will events wait on a two-year commission with so much, uh, so many important meetings and, and perhaps some decisions occurring in 2014? Yes, thank you very much for that question. I'll provide a little bit of background and then my um, uh, ideas about how it will fit into some of the other um, initiatives that are happening right now. It is being spearheaded by two highly respected think tanks. One is the Center for International Governance Innovation that's located in Waterloo, Canada. And then the other one is Chatham House in London. So they are um, facilitating the process. I mentioned that it's being chaired by Carl Bildt, who has a lot of knowledge of these issues and a history of involvement. And uh, it's uh, very difficult to come up with a composition of a panel that is perfect. So no, none, no composition is perfect, but in my opinion, it does include a lot of uh, really respected and knowledgeable people, uh, not only internet governance insiders, but also people who have un understand the high politics issues more, and, but certainly um, you know, f names that you would recognize like Beth Novak and um, Henriette Esterhuizen from South Africa, um, Nee Quainer, Dame Wendy Hall, uh, Joseph Nye, so a lot of really interesting thinkers. What about the two-year time frame? This is not meant to be in contention with the other efforts that are underway, but actually has been um, in consultation and in collaboration. And hopefully we'll take the ball and run with it um, with some of the short-term um, initiatives that are, that are going on. So two years 
is a really long time in internet space, but when you think about the need to have a very formal and deliberative public consultation about the issues, that will, you know, it's more of a long arc of getting um, adequate public input and also hopefully, and you know, time will tell, but hopefully provide some tangible, more tangible recommendations rather than just um, coming up with another set of internet principles or a to-do list. So the two-year time frame is a long one in internet history. Um, I'm optimistic that it will be, um, you know, very, um, will be a follow-on to some of these shorter-term things that are happening. Um, all the players know each other and that uh, hopefully the outcome will be some tangible uh, strategic recommendations. There also is a, uh, a, a component of this that is interested in uh, further empirical research from the academic community about internet governance issues. So um, I'll just put that on the table that there should be a lot of uh, papers and research coming out of this initiative as well to help support in an empirical way some of the strategic visions. And I think, uh, although Laura didn't say it, CIGI, the Canadian institution, has a series of papers on internet governance on their website that some of them are good, some of them aren't. I know that because I wrote one, and so uh, you can figure out which one mine falls into, uh, probably the latter. We had a question over here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Andrew Mack. Uh, Thank you for a great panel. Very interesting. I've heard you all speak before, so terrific stuff. Uh, the uh, I'm a I'm a veteran of 20 some ICANs and IGFs and this kind of thing, so um, very familiar faces. The question is this: to me, is really when we're talking about internet governance, which internet governance are we talking about? Are we talking about the internet governance that is about power? That talking about the internet governance that's about a vision of security and the relationship between the user and the state or the user and corporates? Are we talking about an internet governance that is about economic development, broadly speaking, or employment development, which in many instances is a very different issue, especially when you talk about the global south? I think where, how we ask that question and what we, which, which of those issues or which of those groups of issues we decide to, 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 function, to, to focus in on really is going to depend on what we get out of the back of it. And I was thinking about this, especially in light of the coming Brazil conference. And we now we've got a lot of people who are new in this, a lot of people who are newly, newly active. What do you expect is going to come out of the Brazil conference, and which of these issues do you think they should, ta they should tackle? Thanks. I, I can immediately tell you what's coming out of the Brazil meeting. Just <laughs> let's meet around 26th of April, and I'll tell you. Uh, we'll probably have a DC ISOC event about exactly. that question. But, but you are right that there are different aspects. What we have noticed, uh, though, is that um, there is a substantive discussion going on in different circles about the, the, I would use the term that is more broad, I mean, kind of more commonly used, the internationalization of ICANN. Um, many people understand this differently. Some people say that means ICANN should become a truly international organization recognized by 194 countries and based in Geneva or something like that. Some say, no, ICANN should have more foreigners, n meaning not new US citizens on the board, which ICANN actually has had for the last 10 years or so. But people just don't know it. Uh, the thing is, though, that um, in certain areas, and I think uh, Professor Denardis mentioned that uh, the, the, the question is actually not who governs the Internet. The question is what governs the Internet. In other words, people believe that ICANN is the one that can shut down portions of the Internet. And Jim here in the beginning mentioned something about uh, uh, China where the Internet was effectively pointed to a house somewhere in the Wyoming or whatever and was effectively shut down without anyone having to do anything with root servers or ICANN or anything. But the, the reality is that we need a lot of educational effort, uh, reach out. I mean, people just, some people just don't know how the internet functions. And some people know, but nevertheless, it's a good foreign policy thing to say that ICANN is not international enough. Whatever that means, you know, you can interpret it in different languages differently. Uh, it's, a, it's a very challenging task, and one of the things where, where you've seen, um, like the Brazil meeting, uh, which came out of, um, of a meeting between Fadi Shehari and the Brazilian president, or the fifth panel that uh, 
is chaired by the Estonian president, or just the, the just noted and announced uh, other commissions and, and bodies and structures that we'll be discussing, that only shows there is a need for dialogue. And uh, it's, it's really good that so many people are suddenly interested. It would have been better if they have started to be interested in this topic, uh, as Sally mentioned, in 2003 or 2005, because by now we would have gone through all these discussions. But even now, it's, it's better to sit down and talk about these issues. Okay, we have a couple more questions. We're getting close to the end, though, so if I could ask both people and panelists to speak quickly. Uh, the one here in the... Can you get this one here, Nick? No, this one. Thank you. Right in the front. Hi, my name is uh, Alexa Rod. I'm uh, probably one of the veterans of being at many, many ICANN meetings. Um, I found the panel very, very interesting. There were two things I took away. One, Professor um, Laura Denardis' comment about the fact that uh, the internet governance is multi-layered and it's not just one thing. Uh, and then Mike Nelson's comment about the fact that uh, the, the whole idea <coughs> of um, its melding between control of the infrastructure and control of the content. So one of uh, the, my question is, as I think about the geopolitical events and what has actually affected some of the debates that have come up here, none of them have been fomented by companies or, or um, stakeholders, if you will, in the traditional sense. New Star, VeriSign, PIR have you know, stakeholders within ICANN, or even <coughs> some of the stakeholders within IETF have not really fomented. It's been companies like Twitter, uh, the Arab Revolution um, was really fomented by uh, people posting on Twitter. It was Facebook that the uh, government of Pakistan wanted to shut down and then ended up changing some of the routing tables uh, with, via ISPs and actually ca caused a worldwide outage. It wasn't .com or it wasn't any of the naming and numbering systems. So it is these constituents or if, if these companies that are actually creating some of the questions that we're talking about, both from a privacy uh, uh, and control debate, right? Uh, and also from a geopolitical debate, how much control it, uh, should governments have and, and what kind of thing does it represent? In Iran, during the um, spring, uh, during the revolution, green revolution in Iran, um, a lot of the, um, the people were given away by Nokia's uh, mobile switching, by Nokia, who agreed to give, uh, who had sold mobile switching equipment to the Iranian government and then agreed to give away the mobile numbers of people who were posting on Twitter and their information. Where's Nokia? So in this new debate, when we're talking about stakeholders, how do you foresee some of these companies, some of these applications that are not in the transport, where we initially started from, actually come into the debate? Any volunteers? Just two sentences. Uh, my big vision for Internet Governance 2020 is a system that's really driven by user needs both individual users and business users. We don't have that in the internet governance arena today. I mean, if I had my way, the IGF would be 80% people who don't run any piece of the internet, people who are on the receiving end. Um, what's exciting is that the technology itself is allowing those people a better voice. We've mentioned a few of the things like the SOPA revolt. We're going to see a lot more of that, and I hope it's going to be a lot more constructive. It's not just going to be stop. Mm -hmm. It's going to be pushing ideas forward from the user community. That's part of my vision of unregulation, the idea that by getting be better data and by allowing people to react to that data, we can build political force against certain practices and for other practices, practices that are better for users. But thanks for bringing some optimism into this. Hi, um, my name is John Gudgel. I'm a, a PhD student at George Mason University School of Public Policy, and I'm interested in the uh, regional development, uh, privacy and security aspects of the Internet of Things. And I was kind of glad that Michael kind of raised that briefly, since that, in my mind, is going to be the big thing that's going to be coming up. By year 2020, you're going to have billions of objects 
more objects connected to the internet. So I've, I know that the IGF has a working group, uh, multi-stakeholder working group on the internet of things. I know that the European Union has a multi-stakeholder group uh, looking at the internet of things. And I know that the uh, Federal Trade Commission now is holding uh, working sessions with multi-stakeholders trying to uh, resolve what I, seems to be the primary issue, which is the side that is interested in privacy and security, mainly driven by privacy groups and individuals, and the industry side, which wants open uh, systems non-regulated. So I guess my question is, with this ev evolution of the Internet to the Internet of Things, where does the panel see the bridge between those two very divergent sides, because I see it everywhere within all the notes that I've re reviewed. Well, I hate to be monopolizing the answers, but this is my favorite topic. <laughs> Except I don't talk about the Internet of Things, I talk about the cloud of things. Because without an understanding of where all that data is going and how it's going to be processed in the cloud, we really are only looking at half the system. Uh, some of very misguided policy recommendations have come from that kind of narrow focus on the internet of things or on just the things. Uh, the dumbest policy proposal of the last five years from the European Commission, the right to the silence of the chips. <laughs> it's kind of a cute phrase. The idea was that everybody should be able to somehow disable everything that gets connected to the internet, physically, just be able to you know, rip off the antenna or somehow push a button. Makes sense if everything costs $10, doesn't make sense if it costs two cents. So I think we need to look at the whole system. We need to think about the data rather than the things. And, and we don't have to have a separate privacy policy just for the internet of things. We have to think about the internet of things in the context of our broader approach to did online privacy. But thank you so much for bringing those issues up. I, I think some of the other panelists are, are, are also involved in this. I do think we should always be asking the question, how can the policies we're talking about today influence this cloud of things that is going to be universal in 2020? Uh, this is actually an, an area of uh, interest and passion of mine as well, and I've been working on it a, a fairly long time. Um, I, I think to some degree what you, you're correct in the sense that the public conversation about privacy and the relationship between the individual and the information that is collected about him or her, whether it be through use of things or directly in an exchange with a, with a collector, uh, is driven th through the press by how privacy advocates react to it and how consumers feel about it. But I would argue that in, is, if you look at it from when I started working on this subject in 1999 to today, what you've seen is industry really embrace the concept of becoming a good steward of people's information. And from companies, when I started working on this, very few companies had a C-level official that worked on privacy. Now a significant number of companies do, and it's not just tech companies. You see it in companies like Walmart and GE and, and other companies. So to some degree, I think this is a conversation that is that is coming going in both directions and that there is a, a substantive response coming from industry on the subject and you're going to see they're aware they're very well aware of the of the potential um, conversation that will occur around the internet of things and how it relates to an individual's privacy and dignity uh, as you know or, or may not know although the president announced a, a, a study by John, that will be headed by John Podesta on big data and the relationship between big data and privacy as well as innovation and that will be an important study that, that will take place over the next, I believe, 90 to some number of days in which the administration is thinking very seriously about the very questions that you've just raised. Uh, last question, I think. George Papianis from, from UNESCO. And um, my question has to do with uh, freedom of expression. And I uh, only heard, I may have missed it earlier in the earlier comments, but I only heard Sally Wentworth bring it up. And it seems to me that if we're talking about governance, uh, and governance issues, the freedom of expression is an important part of that discussion, and access to information, which I think was implied in some cases in some of the questions that the young woman over here talking about uh, Facebook being shut down, et cetera, uh, is about freedom of expression and access to information. I just want to get the panel, if I could, to um, address the, uh, this issue in terms of the role that it plays uh, in terms of this larger discussion about governance. 
and a fabulous panel, too. Thank you so much for bringing this together. Uh, why don't we start with Danny? Uh, the American government participates in the Freedom Online Coalition, which is headed by our, in the State Department, by our Office of, of Human uh, Rights and Labor. Um, it, expressive liberty, as it's been uh, presented by Professor Donardis, is a key underpinning to what we want, we, the United States government, want to see out of the Internet, the ability to participate actively in civic and political life and to do so freely. Uh, and we believe that the Internet enables that. But there is an effort to use what the professor talks about as, as critical points within the infrastructure of the Internet to deny people that sort of access, then to deny that pe people that sort of ability. Uh, and we actually fund programs that, in, that enable people to get around those, those kinds of roadblocks, and we will continue to fight the, uh, any effort to put some sort of international approval stamp on practices that restrict people's ability to express themselves. Yeah, I'll just add to that, and I uh, thank you for raising that question. Uh, the, the issue of uh, freedom of expression underpins everything that we've discussed here, if, even if not explicitly stated. So in the area of cybersecurity, we increasingly see distributed denial of service attacks that are used to take down human rights sites and suppress freedom of expression. Um, and you know, take down many other sites as well. In the area of um, innovation policy, it no longer makes sense to separate expressive liberty from economic liberty because in order to express ourselves online, to, to some extent, we need to have the technological tools that enable us to do that. In order to express ourselves, we need a stable infrastructure and connectivity. So I see it as underpinning everything. And then there is also this question of the privatization of governance in which companies who serve as information intermediaries make decisions that in effect determine freedom of expression. For example, if a company like Twitter were to block a reporter's account for, for some reason, that would be an example of a private company that um, would, would have affect freedom of expression. So policy role of private intermediaries, freedom of expression. Innovation policy related to freedom of expression. I would also assert that privacy is closely linked because of the chilling effects on freedom of expression of um, issues related to surveillance. So thank you very much for raising that point. Just a very quick point. Thanks for the question, of course. But luckily, in this particular case, ICANN has nothing to do with content. So this is one of the things where this is another a kind of idea that people have that I can could shut down domain names or take off co uh, content from the internet, and it, we have spent an enormous amount of time explaining that no, this is not what we do. They should not come to us. But there was a, a question about where other institutions, and I think one of the uh, uh, issues is like with cybercrime. Obviously, you cannot rely on the private sector to deal with cybercrime. You need law enforcement. You need governments. You need cooperation. But that's another thing. And that's where private business can do uh, a lot with uh, the government. Thanks. I, I want to thank you for bringing up that issue. I, I touched on it in about one sentence in my remarks, and, and mostly the f fear that some governments have of freedom of expression. We have to make a better case that not only is that good for political discord and, and for discourse, it's also good for innovation and jobs. If people aren't talking across, across uh, national boundaries, they're not part of the global economy. At Georgetown, I teach a class on what's shaping the Internet, and we do a series of case studies. And one of them was on censorship of the Internet in Singapore. And what happened in Singapore is, is very interesting. They were the poster child of Internet censorship in the 90s. But over the years, there's been this increasing pressure, mostly from the business community, to get more access to more information, and most of all, to have a free, more free and open society so that their best people, their most creative people, don't leave the country. So I think we, can, we have to make the case that this is a fundamental human right, but we also can link freedom of speech, freedom of expression to other things that policymakers care about, like innovation and jobs. I should also add that Microsoft cares passionately about this. We're very involved with the Global Network Initiative. I went 32 hours on a flight to Bali so I could talk on a panel about this topic. <laughs> so that's my personal commitment. Uh, I just want to add to what Mike just said, that there was a, a Boston Consulting Group report issued at Davos this week on the subject of the relationship between not just connected networks, but open networks, 
uh, which includes the ability to express oneself and its relative uh, economic benefits by looking at a, doing a comparative study of markets in which there are differing levels of, of, of freedom. And you look at the, and we actually commissioned the United State Department through our chief, Office of the Chief Economist, commissioned a similar report in, which found this, reached the same conclusion coming out of Yale, and we'll be issuing that in a relatively near future. Uh, Dick. Uh, thank you, Jim. Just very briefly, um, one of the most difficult concepts uh, to uh, convince people about, it seems to me, internationally, when they say, how do we form a Silicon Valley? Um, and we've had this discussion at the OECD, I see Barbara Warner out there at uh, various times. And, and the concept that's difficult for people to fully appreciate is you've got to find an environment in which universities, the private sector, and government have interchanges, an exchange of ideas, and a freedom that encourages innovation. When you give that, to that view to countries, they're almost stopped by it because it's hard for them to imagine how you take those three institutions uh, and bring them together, which is the underpinning of Silicon Valley. And then we need to, and then as we emphasize that inherent to those three aspects of our uh, society uh, uh, encouraging innovation is freedom of expression, then that becomes further a very difficult concept. But my point being is it may be difficult but it seems to me we need to continuously repeat that, especially in the Internet space uh, that deals with policy, because if countries don't understand that and appreciate that, then such things as employment and innovation will become very much harder and more difficult for them uh, to, uh, to use to, take them to, to uh, deal with issues, uh, fundamental issues of their economy and their society. Thank you for that question. Ali, did you uh, want to chime in? Uh, sure. I, I also I think you know one of the the <coughs> values that we've spoken about here, and I think Laura really raised it, was this concern about fragmentation. Um, and you know, we we there's tremendous value in a globally interoperable network of networks, and part of that is that. It's free expression, not just within my own community, but between my community and another community. So that, you know, there is a concern that you might have freedom of expression, and I think your question went to this to some degree. You have freedom of expression within a community of, of like-minded or common language groups, but what you really need for the, for the network to be valuable is to encourage that, that interlinkage so that you don't have fragments of communities just talking to each other and not, not across those communities. So I think freedom of expression is, is more complex um, when, we, when we start thinking about um, how people divide themselves up. I'm going to conclude with a prediction for you here because the title I've got on my thing is Internet Governance 2020. Um, so I'll have, it's a two-part prediction. The first is whatever internet governance will look like uh, six years from now, it will not be what it looks like now. So we are inevitably facing change. The second thing, and this one will probably be a little less uh, popular, is internet governance is going to look more like how states interact and how we govern other big international infrastructures. And so that's the path we're on. And defining the contours of that will be very difficult. But if you're a Western audience, um, one of the problems is that that's uncomfortable because it means you're going to be ceding some authority. Mm -hmm. And when I think I'm going to come back to Dick's remark and to Ambassador Sepulveda's remark, when we take into account the concerns of other countries, um, they're going to move in a certain direction. We might want to think about how we shape that. With that, can I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists here for a <laughs>